Hello, this is Mr. White, and in this video we will continue to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to evaluate definite integrals. Here are the two exercises for today, and you'll notice that in both cases we're asked to find the area of a region bounded by graphs, yet we are not provided the graphs. So we'll always start out this kind of problem by drawing a sketch of the graphs, even when we're not explicitly told to do so. Sometimes that's just a good idea, other times it's an absolute necessity, as you'll see here shortly. So let's get to that first one. Rather than rely on a graph and calculator, let's just rely on our brains and a little bit of thinking. Let's think of what this is going to look like. y equals 3x plus cosine of x. Those are uh, transformations of some basic functions back from pre-calculus. So y equals 3x is going to be linear and crossing through the origin with a positive slope. And keep in mind that the scale is going to be along the lines of, if I had a 10 here, again, the, the equation is y equals 3x. So we would have 30 on this axis, right? So let's now think of what effect adding cosine of x will have to this graph. We know that the greatest value that cosine can have is 1, and the least value it can have is negative 1. So the, the, the cosine is simply going to increase or decrease all these y values by some number between 1 and negative 1, or negative 1 and 1 inclusive. So we're going, we're going to get something that just is going to uh, do something more like this. And if we try to draw that even a little bit more carefully, let's consider these particular x values of pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2 and 2 pi. And when x is 0, I'm taking cosine of 0 here, and as well as multiplying 3 times 0. I'll get a, a plus 1, cosine of 0 is equal to 1, at uh, pi over 2 here. When I plug in pi over 2, I'm going to get 0 for cosine. Co cosine of pi over 2 is 0, right? So I'll put a point right here. Um, Cosine of pi, plugging in a pi here, will give us negative 1. So I'll put a dot a little bit underneath the, the line there. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 will give us 0 again, so I'll put a dot right here. And finally, cosine of 2 pi is going to give us 1 again, so we'll put a dot a little bit above the curve. And we can fill in, connect the dots for this graph of y. It's going to do something kind of like that. Now, if you're already feeling skeptical, skeptical about putting that much effort into coming up with a sketch, I'll point out that if we were asked to find the region between x equals 0 and 2 pi, we would have been in, in big luck there because notice that the area that the cosine wave added to this graph in other words, this area that, that's above the line would exactly cancel out this area here. And what that means is, instead of doing the FTC, we could just use a geometry formula and say, hey, that, that area underneath that red curve is going to be exactly equal to the area of this uh, black triangle that I just drew here. And we could use a geometry formula instead. So sometimes those kinds of insights can save you a lot of work. In this case, though, I want an example where we really would feel compelled to use the FTC. So let's go back to our original um, interval of pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2. And let's write the definite integral that represents the area underneath that red curve there. It's going to be the definite integral from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2 of the function 3x plus cosine x, and don't forget the dx. Remember, that's sort of like the, uh, if you think of this as an open parenthesis, the dx is kind of like the closed parenthesis. So through the fundamental theorem of calculus, we now understand the connection between anti-deriving and finding areas under curves, and we understand why we use the same cool squiggly symbol for both of them. Uh, let's go ahead and anti-derive the 3x. Uh, we will get x squared here, and I'll need a 3 halves to balance it out. 
And when I antiderive the cosine, be careful. When students are still new at this, they tend to get the, the deriving and antiderivative confused with sine and cosine. The antiderivative of cosine of x is going to be positive sine of x. The derivative would have been negative sine of x, right? So now that we've antiderived, I get rid of this symbol. I don't write the squiggly anymore, the, the definite integral symbol. Instead, I'll put some, some brackets here. And I'll say I need to evaluate that at both of the endpoints, 3 pi over 2 and pi over 2. So of course, if you're thinking of the FTC formula, this is our little f. And when we've anti-derived it, that's going to be our big F, right? And now we're going to plug B and A into big F and subtract. So let's scroll down a little bit. Um, I'll plug in the, the b value first, the 3 pi over 2, and we'll get 3 halves 3 pi over 2 squared plus sine of 3 pi over 2. And again, that's the b value. So let me go ahead and color code this, uh, move this over, and I'll plug in the a value next, and I'll use green for that. So remember, that is all minus. And since we're subtracting, we're going to have to be mindful of uh, making sure we distribute the negative. So I'm just going to put big parentheses there and then put 3 halves pi over 2 quantity squared plus sine of pi over 2. And I'll worry about the distributing in the next step. Okay, let's uh, simplify. This is going to give me uh, 27 pi squared over 8. Our unit circle helps us out. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is going to, be, going to be negative 1, so I'll say minus 1. And then minus 3 pi squared over 8. And sine of pi over 2 is going to be positive 1, but I need to distribute this negative sign. So it'll be minus 1 again. So be careful, we may have been looking at or expecting that this minus 1 is going to be canceled out by plus 1, and I've seen many students over the years get lulled into assuming that there's going to be some canceling, but there's not here. So let's combine our like terms. If I have 27 pi squared over 8 minus 3 pi squared over 8, that's going to give me 24 pi squared over 8, and 24 over 8 reduces to just 3. I'll put the pi squared. And I'll combine the minus 1 and the minus 1 and get minus 2. I'll put a box around that. That's really the answer I prefer. If you really feel compelled to plug that into a calculator, that would come out to 27.609 approximately. Include that if you like. And of course, I do always encourage you, when you're allowed to use a calculator, or at least you're doing an assignment and it's at your disposal, um, at least use the calculator to check your answer, even if you're not supposed to use it in the process of doing it. All right, not too bad. Let's go on to our next exercise. Okay, same task here. Once again, find the area bound between this curve and the x-axis. But notice that this time we're not given the interval. We're not told to find the area between x equals some number and x equals some other number. So this is the kind of scenario where it's, it's really absolutely necessary that you sketch out these graphs in order to figure out what numbers you want to integrate between. So to figure out what this curve looks like, let's start by just factoring this. Uh, it looks like we could factor out an x squared, and we would then get negative x and then plus 4. And if I set that equal to 0, I can see that x equals 0 and x equals 4 are going to be my x-intercepts. Okay, so that's a start. Um, I can also see the negative coefficient here. The fact that that's a negative coefficient for the leading uh, term there tells us that the end behavior will be positive infinity on, uh, to the left and then negative infinity to the right. So there will probably be some little humps in between, but we, we at least get the sense of what the graph looks like at its ends. Um, let me go ahead and erase this. 
uh, just clear some room here. Now as far as uh, uh, what the rest of the graph looks like, we know the graph can't do this. And do you see what's wrong with that? Well, the problem with that is that there would be a third x-intercept there, and we didn't find a third x-intercept, so it can't be that. Um, likewise, it can't be something like, uh, like this either. Same deal, There's, there was no third x-intercept over here. So what we are to, do, to deduce then is that the graph either comes down and just touches and goes back up and goes back down like this, or alternately, the graph goes through here and then comes back up and just touches and goes back down. Now, the easiest thing to do to, to deduce between those two um, options is let's figure out what happens at some, let's figure out what happens at, say, x equals 2. Let's plug a 2 in there, negative 2 cubed plus 4 times 2 squared. And that's going to give us, let's see, negative 8 plus 16. That's going to give us positive 8 something up here, and that helps us decide. It's not going to be this graph down here, so let's get rid of that one. It's going to be this one. Now, let me, let me emphasize, this was just, I was just showing you how I'd quickly come up with a sketch for this graph. If we really wanted to do a more careful job and a little more methodical approach, we would do things like take the derivative, we would verify exactly where is that horizontal tangent line, where is that extreme right there, um, as well as verify that that's an extreme as well. We can do all sorts of other calculus analysis, but I think our sketch is good enough as is right now. So if we want the area bounded by this curve, which we just sketched out, and the x-axis, we see that there's really only one area that's completely bounded by both of those curves, and that would be this area right here. And we now see what limits of integration um, we should be using. In other words, what two numbers we should integrate between. So let's write our integral. We're going to go between 0, x equals 0, and x equals 4 for the curve negative x cubed plus 4x squared. And again, don't forget the dx. Like I said, this is like an open parentheses. This is like your closed parentheses. And let's start antiderivating. So if I anti-derive negative x cubed, I would get x to the fourth, a one-fourth to balance it out, and then that negative hanging in front. And then as far as the 4x squared there, I would get an x cubed, a one-third to balance it out, and then that 4 is in front. And I'll just go ahead and put the 4 up in the numerator. I'll put a plus sign. Again, I've just anti-derived, so we'll put the brackets here and put the 4 here and the 0 here. And as I mentioned in the last exercise, if you're thinking of the FTC formula, this would be your little f, and this is your big F, and we're going to plug B and A into big F and subtract. So let's proceed. If I take this 4 and plug it in, I'm going to get 4 to the 4th, but then I'm going to divide it by 4. So really that results in 4 to the 3rd, right? So that's going to give me uh, negative 64. Now when I plug it in here, um, I'm going to get 4 cubed times another 4. That's like 4 to the 4th, then divided by 3. So that's going to result in 4 to the 4th, or 256, divided by 3. Now we run into a little luck here when we uh, plug in the 0. It just so happens that that gives us a zero here and a zero here. Be careful, that's not always going to work 100% of the time. For example, if we had integrated and gotten a cosine of x, then plugging in a zero would not give us zero. It would give us one, right? But in this case, we did indeed get zero, so I can just put minus zero as a formality. And if I do the common denominator thing, three over 3, I'm going to get negative 196 over 3 plus 256 over 3, and that is going to give me 64 over 3. Or, if you prefer, approximately 21.333.
or I could put the repeating decimal, in which case it will be precisely equal. Okay, and we'll put a box around that. And of course, let's check by calculator and verify that indeed we do get the same answer. 21.3 repeating, 21.3 repeating.